Open your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 2. We'll be reading there in those opening verses in a bit. I want to thank Ryan for doing that. It took a lot of boldness to stop that song after just three verses. I've been wanting to do that to open up a sermon for a really long time, and I found the right candidate willing to do so. Did you know there are four verses to that song? And the title of the song is where it's supposed to end. With none of self and all of thee. But if we're kind of self-assessing today and calling it what it is, sometimes the wavelength kind of ups and downs of even Christians' lives are kind of like baseline verse 1, and on our best days, we get up to verse 3. In our worst days, it's none of Jesus, all of me, that's all I can think about. And then in our best days, maybe we whisper things like, I think it's more about you than it is about me. And maybe I take on less. I'm still a part of the thing, but I take on less of a role. And for some of us, that's as high as we can ever get. And so really the theme of today and tonight's study is what would it feel like to break through? What if you finally got to verse four? We're going to sing it at the end if you're not sure what it is. But what if you got past just less of you and more of Jesus and you actually took the words of Jesus and imprinted them on your heart when Jesus said to deny yourself? What if you took the lowest role and it was a bold outward proclamation? My life is all about Jesus And I'm just here as a vessel on his table and as a piece of his body servicing the other pieces. There are people who've been in the church a long time and do not yet know what that feels like. We chase greatness in the wrong ways. Jesus said in Mark chapter 9, he said, you want to know what greatness is? Greatness is being least of all and servant of all. That's not some of Jesus, some of me, some of you, some of me. That's not even less. That is all Christ and his people, and I just service his needs. Philippians 2 talks about this. And what we're going to try to do today is assess why is it that selflessness, complete self-sacrifice, is so difficult why is it so dangerous? And as we go into tonight's study, how do, we, how do we fix it? What do we do? How does the Lord fix it? But I want you to see his ideal for your life. Read this with me. In Philippians chapter 2, talking about Christ's people. If there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if there's any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind. Maintaining the same love, united in spirit on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness. Do nothing from empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. And then he pushes it even further. After all, being a disciple of Jesus means we're supposed to be like Jesus. The concept isn't, I walk around serving me and I wear the name Jesus. I want to become like Jesus. So I want to have this attitude. He says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He wasn't even reaching for it. He emptied himself, taking the form of a bond serving, being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself. By being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Do you know what that feels like? Full surrender. All in. Falling into the arms of the Lord and saying, use me up. Take everything I have because it is none of me and all of you and you. That's the goal and that's where we're headed with this lesson. Now, to help us understand how all that works, we need to talk about what some of the problems look like. So I'm going to reintroduce to you a term that I used a couple of years ago. And if you're new here or visiting, maybe you haven't heard it before. But are you familiar with the me bubble? Who knows about me bubbles? Do we have any me bubblers in the room today? There are points and times in which everyone in this room is in their own me bubble. Some of them are in one right now. Stick with me. 
What does it feel like and look like to be in a me bubble? Here's what someone in a me bubble is like. First of all, they talk a lot about themselves. I, me, mine, my family, my kids, my life, my stuff. They focus very much on themselves over and above everyone else. They like to do things. They like to be involved in things and be active, but they do what they want to do. And they don't do things they don't want. That's what a me bubbler does. They say, if I want to do it, I bring it in tight and I do it. If I don't want to do it, then it goes outside. A me bubbler allows people into their bubble, but only people that make them feel good and somehow service their needs. If my relationship with you is benefiting me, if you understand your role, and by the way, your role is to make me feel good about myself, then you're allowed in the bubble. But if not, then you're outside the bubble. Me bubblers, let me just say something about them. They are very sometimes charitable. Me bubblers will give and do. They're not totally self-absorbed, but they want people to know about it. I want you to know that I gave to the poor. I want you to know some of what I'm doing because ultimately I'm doing because it ends up servicing who? Me. It makes me look good. It makes me feel good. It brings some joy into my heart. So the me bubbler talks a lot about themselves. And by the way, your kids is just an extension of you. So don't think you're selfless if you talk all the time about your kids. That's still you. Talk a lot about self, do the things that they want to do, associate with the people who make them feel good, and give if it services them. A professional me bubbler, any pros in the room? A professional me bubbler has found a way to walk around in this bubble every day with mirrors lining the inside walls. So you don't even see anybody anymore. I don't even see you. I just see myself. Everything is about me seeing me. And it's really, it sounds exciting. It's actually not very exciting because the me bubbler is staring at themselves all day. Sometimes they like what they see and sometimes they hate what they see, but all they see is themselves. So they have to go through some of the joys of I'm awesome and they have to ride all of the terrible bottoms of I'm a humiliating, awful, gross person. Like everything is about themselves. And the problem, of course, is that everything I just described to you is the exact opposite of Jesus his day one instruction to his disciples and everything about why I'm here and what I'm supposed to do. Now, me bubblers, and I've been there, they can be sort of harmless. I mean, look, if you want to go around just thinking about yourself all the time, go ahead. You know, we'll see how that works out for you. And sometimes when you get two me bubblers in the room, it's kind of humorous. Have you ever watched two me bubblers have a conversation? It's terrific. I used to kind of walk around church buildings going, oh, there we go. All right, I'm going to watch this. Here's how it works. Two me bubblers walk up to each other and they kind of bump their bubbles. They kind of, but you're not in mine and I'm not in yours. So we're just kind of like, and they're staring at each other, which I think is a good thing. And they're looking. And so one of them starts talking and here's what it sounds like. You ready? I, me, mine, mine, vacation, me, family, mine, house, stuff, me, job, happy, unhappy, right, wrong, me, I, and self. And the other person sits there and waits for them to finish. But when they finish, what does the other person say? They go, well, I, me, mine, more, mine, better vacation, nicer house, better job, mine, me, my, think, my thinkings, my ideas, my stuff. And the other one waits. Sometimes they don't even wait for them to finish. And then they go right. They're monologuing at each other. They're like, they're, they don't even see each other. And they're just talking about themselves. And I'm going to be honest with you guys. And I've tried not to do this lately, but I've wanted to walk around with a hundred dollar bill in my pocket. And just watch these conversations happen. And the first time someone finishes talking about themselves, self, self, me, mine, my kids, wow, man, three home runs, awesome. And the other one comes back and says, you know, would you tell me a little bit more about that? The first time someone asks a follow-up question, I'm just going to pull $100 out of my pocket and go, here you go, man. That's like the coolest thing I've seen all day. You know what? I'd probably keep that 100 bucks in my pocket most of the time, wouldn't I? There's that tendency in all of us to focus on ourselves. And as I've told you from this pulpit a hundred times, you are at the center of every experience you ever have. So you're fighting the bubble all the time. Now, again, that can be sort of harmless, but here's, here's the problem. And you're still in Philippians 2, you're in a good spot. The problem is when you take a person who spends most of their time focused on themselves, their family, what they like, what they don't like, their ups and their downs, and you put them in a system, it gets dangerous. 
Look, they're going to go out and live by themselves. It'll just go how it goes. I don't know. The Lord will do what he does. But if you take those people and you say, we want to put you into something that's bigger than yourself. We want to put you in a business. And in this business, you're going to have some bosses. And in this business, they're going to be fellow employees. And in this business, they're going to be patrons or customers. And if you take someone who only focuses on what they want and you put them in an environment like that, they become cancerous to that environment. All of a sudden, they're not just a nuisance. They're an actual destructive, divisive force. If you take a me bubbler and you put them in a family and they don't care about their spouse or their kids or others like they care about themselves and they want everyone else to service their needs, the family falls apart. And when you take those people and you put them in a body and they're a thumb or an eye or an ear, we're going to read 1 Corinthians 12 in a minute. And you say, look, you're an ear. We love ears. You're a great looking ear, but you're just a part of something bigger than you. And you actually serve someone greater than you. All of a sudden, the me bubble becomes very dangerous to God's people. In Philippians chapter two, it's not just about it can't be about me. Verse three, it can't be selfish. It can't be empty. It's not just that I need to look out more for others. It's because verse two, we're trying to pursue some unity. We want to share the same thinking. We want to spread around the same amounts of love, all of us pushing it out towards others. We want to be united in spirit and we want to be set on one purpose. If you look back in chapter 1 and verse 27, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come and see you or remain absent, here's what I will hear, that you're standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. How's that supposed to work? How are we supposed to strive together for the faith of the gospel? To hold up as pillars of the truth, to serve the destitute in our community, to pick up those who are fallen and to help others. If really I'm here for me, what are you talking about? I go to the Lindale Church because I like what I get there. I'm a member of the body of Christ because I'm pretty interested in the stuff Jesus has offered me. If that's what it is, then what we'll find will follow is division. So that's why I'm telling you this is worth studying. It's worth going, that's what we're going to do this morning. Like, am I in one of those things? How do I know if I'm in one of those things? And where am I starting to cause trouble? Tonight, well, we're going to be in the book of Jude today, but tonight we're going to come back and go, here's how you pop that thing. You just, you'll hear the sound when it happens. And we're going to look at how to do that. But I want you to understand the concept of division. Go to 1 Corinthians with me, but not yet chapter 12. I want you in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Anybody know about the Corinthian church and how things were going? Boy, they had a lot of trouble. If you could only figure out what this trouble was about. A guy had his father's wife. He was in some kind of a relationship that was wrong. Chapter 5, uh, two of them were suing each other. Uh, that's, that, that wasn't a good look for the church, you know. First Corinthians chapter 6, they're suing each other. Uh, there's all kinds of issues. In chapter 11, they're not taking the Lord's Supper together. And like they're leaving the poor people out. It's, it's really a bad situation. I think it's really beautiful that he calls them brethren in chapter 1. But he explains it in this way. And I want you to see if you can pick up on it. You guys know how much I love the pronouns. Check this out. Now, I exhort you, brethren, chapter 1, verse 10, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, no divisions, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now, I mean this, that each of you is saying, I am of Paul and I have Apollos and I have Cephas and I have Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And he goes on to talk about that a little bit further. So what we have is a church where they're supposed to be serving. It's supposed to be about the body and the growth and the help. And instead, they're dividing. Why are they dividing? Well, first of all, we know what's going on. You got a Paul group and a Peter group and a Cephas group. Do you know that you can figure out what's going on by those quotes? Did you see them? I am of Paul, I of Apollos, I of Cephas, and I of Christ. There is a word that is different in each one of those. Paul, Apollos, Cephas. But do you see the word that's the same? Every one of those statements starts with what? Oh, there you are. Hi, welcome. Every one of those statements starts with I. I'm of Paul. That's who I follow, and that's who I'm going to follow, and you're not like me. And so he says, well, you know what? Well, that's good. I am of Apollos, who's a far more eloquent speaker. 
all of their division was sourced in self-centeredness. And so you, you naturally you say, well, I've got friends here. It's not like I'm all by myself. Well, a lot of times we create parties, don't we? We pull together the Christians that belong. Mitch, I'm, you're in my circle because Mitch makes me feel good about myself. And he also is of, well, let's be of Christ because that's the best group. He's of Christ too. So I like that. And I'm going to round up some eye of Christers, but it is all focused on self. And so division is the result. And that's why we have to talk about this. Now, as you go to 1 Corinthians 12, you see that God has a much better plan. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you'll notice in verse 7 that the Holy Spirit dispenses gifts. And, and it's true in the church. I mean, some people are just going to have more gifts than others. If it's about who seems more important or who gets the most accolades, then that selfishness is going to rip us to pieces. But all of those gifts are given for our common good because we, verse 12, are the body of Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? When you became a Christian, you said, it's no longer about me. It's not about me. I tried that and it didn't work. I am giving myself over to being a functioning part of what honors the Son of God. That's my life now. That's a bubble popping. And as part of that, we're going to work together. And so in verse 12, for even as the body is one and yet has many members and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. And it's Jew, Greek, it doesn't matter. For the body is not one member, but many. We all are a part of this unity. Verse 23, there are some who seem less honorable, but they're given abundant honor. Verse 24, there are some who, who are in different positions. But look at verse 25. You fit into this as a servant of the body of Christ. You are a Christian to give and serve and love. Watch. So that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And that's very important. There's, there's a couple things going on in that verse. What we don't want is division in the body. We don't want Christians running in different directions. We don't want a party system. We don't want to fight and quarrel and tear the body of Christ apart. The opposite of division is caring for one another. And that's how division works. I will take my ball and go home. I don't like this anymore. This is becoming hard for me. I'm being asked to make compromises. If you're here for you, you will eventually leave in the name of you. That's the way it works. The opposite of me seeking out me is caring for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Verse 26, if one is honored, all the members rejoice. You are Christ's body and individually members of it. So there's our layout to start today's lesson throughout the day. Am I a me bubbler? How do I know? And do I understand that if I want to be a fruitful part of a family, a business, a community, a body, a church, that I have to get to verse four of the song that we'll sing at the end. And I have to become someone who can take the lowest place to accomplish my greatest role. Now that sets us up for the book of Jude. So I don't have any slides today because the rest of this morning's lesson and all of tonight's lesson is in the book of Jude. So everybody head over there with me and I want you to see what's going on. The first thing I want you to notice when you get to Jude is that the problem we are laying out here is discussed in this short letter. It's just a one chapter letter. He wanted to write to them about their common salvation. So let's read Jude verses one through four. He wanted to talk about something. He had to talk about something else. The text opens in this way. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, a brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints." You see what he's saying? He's saying, I just want to write about Jesus. I want to write about who we are. I want to write about why we're here. I want to write about how we can serve him better and save souls and do the work. But instead, we actually need to take a stand for the faith. Why does he need to do that? Verse four, four, certain persons 
have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for their condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now, I'll tell you now, that's extreme. I don't have a list in my pocket with Lindell members' names on it going there, verse four. I need to find a way to tell them today. That's not the nature of the sermon. But I do want you to see is that self-centered, me-focused language can go farther than you ever thought that it would. These people have become people who are so given to their personal licentiousness. They're in the church. They're among the church. They're recognized as members of the church. And yet Jesus is not their master. More of self and less of him. Verse 12. These are the men, verse 12, who are hidden reefs in your love feasts. When they feast with you without fear. Now, if you have a pencil and you're willing to underline it, this is your phrase. Caring for who? So like they're at church. They're in the local body. They attend the love feast. And I won't make any controversial comments about what the love feast is. Maybe it's the Lord's Supper. Maybe it's Christians eating together. Probably it's all of that. It's koinonia activity. But Christians are spending time together because that's what Christians do. They're in the midst of God's people. They don't have any fear because they just kind of fit right in. They care for themselves. And that makes them clouds, which is a good thing, especially in Texas in July. But there's no water in them. Why? They're clouds that are sucking up. They're sucking up the moisture and they're not providing any. That's what the me bubble does. It says, what can I get? What about me? I see everything in that way. Carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars from whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. That last phrase is interesting, the wandering stars. You know, you'd use a star to kind of figure out where to go. Don't follow these guys because these guys are going where they want to go. And they're doing what they want to do. And if you follow them and they get done with you, they're going to put you aside. Verse 19, here it is. Verse 19. Oh, let's back up to verse 17. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken before him by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you, look, in the last time, in the last time there will be mockers following after their own godly lusts. These are the ones who cause, what do they cause? What does it always cause? You see it? It always causes division. You know what's interesting about the me bubbler is they're not trying to cause division. You ever notice that? The person who is really focused on themselves, and they don't take instruction well, and they don't like to be corrected, and they don't want to change, and they're always comparing themselves to others, and the songs were too slow, and all that stuff. Like, they're not trying to cause division. They just want what they want for themselves. But what I want you to see today is the inevitable outcome of being in a system greater than you, but focused on you is schisms. It's the ultimate outcome. And in verse 19, it's put this way. These are the ones who cause division. Why? Because they're worldly minded, which, you know, our world, very humanistic, very self-centric, very me and my family and my things. And they're devoid of the Holy Spirit, which will be our study tonight. Our study will be if you want to pop that bubble and you would like to know what verse four, you're going to sing it in a minute. Be careful with that. You're about to sing it. But if you really want to know what verse four feels like, full surrender, arms open, falling into the hands of the Lord and only getting up to see who you can embrace and help, then we're going to read the rest of this chapter tonight and we're going to see what it means to abandon the ways of the world and live according to the Holy Spirit. But for the rest of today's lesson, we're laying groundwork this morning. I want to be very clear on what me bubbles look like at their most dangerous level. And here's what I want you to do as we finish. I want you to be asking yourself. I mean, we all have these tendencies. No one is perfect. This is not about perfection. We don't want anybody to leave. We just want to pop a few bubbles. We're all here and we want to make it right. But as you're looking at this, I want you to think, is this, is this indicative of, of, of me? And do I understand what I gave up when I became a Christian? And am I ready to make changes? Now, how do we know if we are a dangerous me bubbler? Well, go back to verse 11. Three points right there. I was going to make a slide, but they're right there in the text. You don't need a slide for this. He said, let me tell you what's going on with these people. And my personal week was spent trying to decide if I'm, if I'm carrying these characteristics. So I want you to do it too. He said in verse 11, let me tell you about them. They have gone the way of Cain 
and for pay they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. There are your three indicators. You're like, how am I doing? Everybody's got a little self in them. We all have things that happen. But how do I know if I need to repent? If big changes are needed? Well, it's really simple. If you've gone the way of Cain, you need to come back. If you have found yourself going headlong into the error of Balaam, it is time to change your direction. And if you are in the rebellion of Korah, the ground is going to swallow you up and it's time to make changes. So what did those mean? Anybody know what happened with Cain and Abel? Hey, a lot of our young ones are starting, really our young adults are starting Bible survey this week. Cain and Abel. Cain was a tiller of the ground and Abel had the livestock. And so when it came time to make an offering to the Lord, everybody's happy. Nobody's put out. They just both make their offerings. And Cain offers the fruit and Abel offers the animal sacrifices. And the text says that God was displeased with Cain. Does that ever happen? You think you think you ever do things that God's displeased with you? I think that happens. We all do that. That's not that's not the end of the road. But they find that that God's displeased with him. And so he gets angry. He doesn't like being told that he's wrong, hates being told that he's wrong doesn't feel like it's just that God had said this to him. And we don't know a lot about it. It's probable that God had talked to them about animal sacrifices and Cain had done the wrong thing. But God comes to Cain and he goes, check it out, Cain. You made a mistake. That was not what I wanted. You're wrong and your brother's right and you need to make a change. And if you'll just stop what you're doing right now, okay, check this out. This is really simple. Stop. Just stop and listen. Stop and listen. You did the wrong thing. You need to turn and do the right thing. You need to admit that you're wrong. All you have to do is turn it around and everything is fine. God pleads with Cain, but Cain cares about Cain. And you know when it gets its worst? When you're mad. Anger is the clearest revelation of the bubble in which I live. When Cain got upset, all he could think about is that it wasn't fair that God was upset with him, that it isn't right that his brother doesn't have to make any changes, and that he is being corrected and told to repent. And so instead of being humble and saying, you know what, this isn't about me. I made a mistake. It's not about me, though. It's about God. I'm going to change because Cain made it about Cain. Instead of repenting, what did he do? He murdered his brother. You think that was about his brother? Raise your hand if you think Cain killing Abel was about Abel's benefit. Was Cain killing Abel about God's benefit? I'm going to tell you that God and Abel were not on Cain's mind at all. You know when me bubblers are dangerous? When they're mad. Correct a me bubbler and prepare to be bumped off the edge of a cliff. Me bubblers don't like to be told that they're not right because of the pride that goes along with self-elevation. One of the things we need to learn is that the way of Cain and how you react when you get corrected and when you learn that you're wrong about something and when you have to acknowledge that someone else is right about something that's the biggest revelation on whether God can help you and use you or not. You know, we got elders here and what a tough job. You know what the toughest thing that an elder has to do really is when they have to go meet with someone in our church and say, you know what? We don't believe that you've been doing the right things. And we want to sit and study with you and we want you to start coming and being a more involved part of our worship service. Or, or we think you need to evaluate what's going on in your marriage. Now, most of you have never been elders, but anybody know how that usually goes? More times than not, it does not go well. Because see, the me bubbler can do what they, what they want to do and they just kind of come to church or they don't come to church and they do what they want to do. But when they're told, hey, you're in a system. You're a part of something bigger than yourself and you've made a mistake and you need to change it. That's when things start ripping apart. Am I a me bubbler? How do I react when I'm wrong, when I'm angry, when I'm the one that needs to change? Number one is the way of Cain. The second thing that makes it dangerous is when they go headlong into the error of Balaam. You guys know the story of Balaam? It's found back in the book of Numbers. I've got notes in the back with all the verse references. But back in Numbers chapter 22, this nation, this king of a nation comes to Balaam and says, hey, we'd like to pay you to help us curse God's people. 
Sounds like a bad idea. We'd like to pay you to come tell us how do we take the Yahweh God's people and how do we get them off of our back? And so Balaam said, let me go ask God and see what he says, which is a little questionable and weird. But he goes to God and he's like, God, is it okay if I go with Balak and curse your people? What does God say? No. No. And so to Balaam's credit, you know, Balaam does want to do what God said. Balaam goes back to Balak and says, I I can't, I can't go with you. God said, no, it's not. You can see Balak like doing the change in the bag though going, what, what'd God say? He's like, God, quit, quit shaking the change. God, here's another bag. Stop showing me the money. God said, no, but Balaam said, God said, no, but let me go ask him one more time. Why did he do that? Balaam was caught in this concept called greed. He saw gain and he wanted that gain. He wanted to honor God, but he also wanted money in his pocket. He wanted to do the right thing, but he couldn't leave money on the table that could be brought into his pocket. So he goes back to God the second time and God says, go ahead and go. And then a donkey appears to him or a donkey talks to him and keeps him from being killed. God is angry with him. Numbers chapter 22, God is angry. In the New Testament, we have two passages that help us understand what happened. First of all, in 2 Peter, we're told that Balaam succumbed to the wages of unrighteousness. When he had to choose between honoring God and protecting God's people or just going over here on the side and accumulating more for himself, he chose to accumulate more for himself. You know what the really sad thing is? He actually gave Balak really great advice. He said, hey, if you want to diminish God's people, all you need to do is put a few idols in their camp and send a few of your most beautiful ladies over there. If you send some of those ladies, little idols in their pockets, you'll have them in no time. And the book of Revelation says following the way of Balaam weakened God's people. What would be worth weakening God's people? Can I ask you? I'm asking you. What would be worth weakening God's people? What would be worth making this church less strong? What what would be worth a a prioritized kind of dismay where where we're not focused on God like we should be? Well, you say, well, nothing would be. But to the me bubbler, they know that. But if not being with God's people puts extra money in my pocket, I I gotta, I gotta, I I gotta, I gotta get what's mine. If if a little bit of a disregard for Christians and a little bit of less giving for Christians and a little bit of less helping this work is the stage, they always talk about their seasons of life. I'm in the season of life right now where I gotta, you know, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta do this. I gotta do this work and make this money and compromise this. And but listen, they'll. Come another season when I'll be able to fully invest myself in the work of God. For the me bubbler, there's only one season. It's me season. That's the only season that there is. And so when we talk about Balaam, you want to know how my bubble's doing? What do you choose when you can choose selfless investment in the people of God, giving your time, your energy, your voice, your wisdom, your money, or leaving that and continuing to accumulate for yourself. The me bubbler is always going to end up here in the end. Is that something that you've been doing? The third thing is this. He says the way of Cain, which is anger, unable to be corrected, prideful. The error of Balaam is materialism and wages of unrighteousness, a keeper's heart, if you will. And then there is the rebellion of Korah. Go back to 1 Corinthians 12. We'll wind this thing down. 1 Corinthians 12. The story of Korah is found back in Numbers chapter 16. And do you remember about Korah? Korah was Moses' cousin. Korah was a Levite. He was a very privileged man. Korah was allowed to be among the tribe of the Levites. Korah was a teacher of the law. He was intimately connected with all the different things that God was doing. But he and his sons were not allowed to be the high priest. Okay, they were down here doing the menial tasks, a part of the blessed Levite nation that God had protected and given goods to. But he became jealous. Anger, greed, jealousy. That's it. You say, well, I focus a little bit more on me than others. It's not a big deal. Wait till you get angry. Wait till there's money on the table or time or greed. Or wait till you get jealous of someone else. Korah became jealous, jealous that Moses and and Aaron, I should say, Aaron and his his children got to be the high priest and Korah, his cousin, did not get to be the high priest. And he actually, check this out, so great, Korah. 
Korah wanted his kids. Blink twice if this sounds familiar. I want my kids to get what your kids are getting. I don't like the role we're being relegated to and where you are. So he actually rallies up the whole church. Their time rallies up all of them and gets everybody to get mad at Aaron. Why? For some big noble reason? To remedy some utter inequity? He rallies up everybody to fight, but who are they fighting for? Korah. He's rallied up troops to fight for his family. And it causes such a division because now people are like, I, what do we do? I mean, maybe God is unjust. Maybe some do have roles that they shouldn't get. Maybe, maybe this isn't right. And so what does God do? You remember what God did? God said, here's what I think about division. He divided the earth. He pulled the earth apart and Korah and his children that he loved so much and 250 of the men who had his back fell into the hole and were swallowed up and died. Guys, that's what, that's what God thinks about division among his people. That's what God thinks about comparing ourselves to one another. What he should have said is, I'm thankful I get to be a part of this. I'm a Levite. There's nothing more blessed in the world than being a priest of God. I'm thankful for what I am a part and I love the service that I get to do. But instead, all he could do is compare himself to someone else, perceive unfairness and go out for justice. Hey, go out and fight for justice, but fight for someone else's justice. You know what I mean? Fight for God's justice. Fight for the church's justice. Strength to make a difference, not me. 1 Corinthians 7 paints a very different picture. 1 Corinthians 7 says, and 1 Corinthians 12, pardon me, in verse 7, 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says, we're fighting for the common good. Like, this is about us, not me. I'm not a big guy on tattoos, but if you want to get one, put us, not me somewhere. You can see it every day. Us, not me. You, not me. Me for you. Come up with some, some thing that puts us together. But ultimately, this is about the will of God. It's about the body of Christ. He was a part of it. I want you to get this. Cora was a part of it. It just wasn't the part he thought he deserved. And so he got taken out of it. That's what I want you to see. That's the problem with the me bubble. It ultimately fights for what it believes that it deserves and gets put out of it instead. On the contrary, verse 25, the Lord said the body of Christ should have no division because we're so busy caring for one another. And that whole chapter, right? I'm out of time today, but that whole chapter is about it doesn't matter if you're an ear or an eye or a foot or what part of the body that you are. Those who think that they're a big deal like the eye, you know what? We don't talk about them very much. But those who are a lesser deemed part of the body, we give them tons of honor because we want you to know that every part matters when you're given to the whole. And you're servicing it. Let's finish this. So go back to Jude. So it's kind of a big setup today because tonight we're going to pick up in verse 17. We're going to look at this gloriously simple pattern for how do you pop the me bubble? How do you turn the attention in the right direction? And what does verse four really look like in your life? All that's coming in just a little bit. But I want to finish with two quick thoughts. One at the beginning of Jude and one at the end when we're finished. Number one, look in Jude verse three. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation... I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. Interesting word study. If you're a word student, go check this out later. But the word common on common salvation is like blah. It's like unholy, mundane. Why would he call our salvation like I wanted to write to you about our salvation? You know why he does that? It's a setup in this letter. He's saying our it's like a hyperbole. Our common salvation is just us on the floor serving Jesus. That's our common salvation. It's just about being the least in the room and giving ourselves over to God. It's not fancy. You're not shining out ahead of everyone else. It's not about you. It's just this unholy. That's what that word means. Like this unholy salvation. Some of them didn't want that. They wanted elevation. And he said that is a threat to the faith. If you're interested to get started in the right direction and you're interested in a common salvation that elevates Jesus and others over yourself, then finish in verses 24 and 25. Here's where the focus needs to be and we'll finish with it tonight. Now to him, now to him, not to me, but to him, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy to the one 
and only to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. I know this is not a hand raising church, but if it was. This would be our moment. You. You. You saved me. You love us. You have made us something amazing. You're the preserver. You're the helper. Your salvation. Not me. Remember, if you live for yourself, your greatest benefit is what you can provide yourself. And that's not really great. If you live for Jesus, your greatest benefit is what Jesus can provide for you. And that is surpassing greatness. Who's ready to make it about Jesus? All about Jesus. Back end of it, he'll take good care of you. Don't you worry a moment about that. But it starts with full surrender. If you're ready for full surrender, come now as we stand and sing.